I hope you enjoyed Anders' definition of a blockchain. He really made a legendary video and the tool that he used here was really fantastic as well for conveying exactly what's going on with a blockchain. However, Anders' definition in that video was of a very generic general blockchain. So there's a couple clarifications I want to make about how the Ethereum blockchain in particular works. So the first thing I want to point out is that Anders had said that when we do this mining process, we are looking for a hash that starts off with some number of leading zeros right here. That's not entirely correct per se. Let me show you what's really going on behind the scenes. I want you to remember for a second, a couple of videos ago, we spoke about account addresses, public keys, and private keys. And we said that those were all hexadecimal encoded numbers. So even though they look like a string of numbers and letters, we can really think of them as being solely one large number. The hash that you see right here works in exactly the same way. So I can copy the hash. I can open up my JavaScript console in the browser. I can place a 0x, which instructs JavaScript that I'm about to place a hexadecimal number, and then paste the hash, and then press Enter. So you'll see that this really is a base 10 number right here. We can think of the hash as being a number. Now, Anders had specifically said that we are looking for a hash that starts off with some number of zeros. Again, that's not entirely correct. What we are really looking for is a hash that is less than some target value. So 000F727 might be less than some target value that our algorithm is looking for. Let me show you an example of this in a flow diagram to just make sure it's really clear. All right, so on the left-hand side here, we've got some amount of data that will be input to our given block. And then next to it, we have that nonce value, which you can think of as being a counter variable. So on the first step through that proof of work algorithm, we take our data of hi there, we join it together with the nonce, like we literally stick those two values together, and then we hash the output, which might come out as this A230 blah, blah, blah. You can then imagine that behind the scenes, we take that hash right there, convert it to a base 10 number, and then we ask if this number right here is less than some target value. And let's imagine right now that that target value is 1000. We say, is that less than 1000? No, it's not. Okay, then we need to continue looking for another value. Let's increment the nonce by one, do the hash again, convert that to a base 10. Is that less than 1000? No, okay, let's keep going until eventually we end up with hi there plus a nonce of five. That gives us an output hash of 0077 BBB. Maybe that is equal to 100. Okay, 100 is less than the target value of 1000. That means we have had, we have found a valid solution. So he is correct that we are kind of looking for a hash that starts with some number of leading zeros, but in reality, we're actually looking at the value of the hash rather than just a specific number of zeros. I want to continue just a little bit more on this point just to because it is a rather important idea that ties into a very critical aspect of the blockchain. So another way of looking at this is to imagine the entire range of possible hash values. The hashes that we are working with are 64 characters long. So right here, this is 64 characters right here. I can do a like this, you know, let's wrap it inside of a string. And I can do a dot length. And you'll see that it is in fact 64 characters long. So if we imagine the entire range of numbers that can be encoded inside of that 64 character string, it can range all the way from all zeros, which rep would represent a base 10 value of 10, or it could be all Fs, which in hexadecimal would end up as being something like 1.15 times 10 to the 77th. A good way of imagining this is to imagine the proof of work algorithm as someone giving you a giant handful of dice, like 64 dice, you know, imagine holding 64 dice in your hand and someone telling you, I want you to roll those dice until you eventually come up with a value of the dice that is less than like 100. Well, chances are you're going to have to roll those dice many, many, many times before you eventually roll something that totals up to less than 100. So that's the idea here. Now, I said that this was kind of a critical idea to wrap your head around, and let me tell you why. I'm going to expand on that just a little bit. So the entire process of rehashing the data along with the incrementing nonce takes some amount of time. Our computers can execute many, many, many hashes per second, like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hashes per second. However, 
in the real blockchain, we are looking for some target values or these this kind of like comparison value right here, this less than 1000. We are looking for some very small target values. So that means that in practice, even though our computers can hash all this data very quickly, we have to execute so many hashes to eventually find that random number that is less than the target value that it ends up taking many seconds of time in the real world. We refer to the amount of time that it takes to hash everything from zero to the target nonce value as something called block time. That's essentially the amount of time it takes to run these hundreds of thousands of different possible hashes until we find that final value that actually equates what we're looking for. So when we think back to the transaction that we executed a couple videos ago where we sent ourselves some money and that took like 30 seconds or so, that 30 seconds represented how long it took to run this proof of work algorithm to eventually find a solution. It was a block time of about 30 seconds. Now in reality, it was actually less than 30 seconds to run the proof of work algorithm, but once one individual node on the Ethereum network finds a solution, it then has to distribute that solution to other nodes. And so that additional amount of time is what eventually added up to the 30 seconds. Now there's just one last thing I want to tell you about the block time right here. The Ethereum network has a target block time of 15 seconds. So ideally, in a perfect world, to calculate one block, it would only take 15 seconds of time. And then the network would move on to calculating the next block or the next set of transactions to be executed. But in practice, that is entirely variable. So what's really happening behind the scenes is that kind of difficulty target right here. Remember I had said that we were looking for a number less than 1,000. This number right here ends up being adjusted over time after every single block is calculated. The network looks at how long it took to calculate the previous block and it says, okay, if this was really high or way, if the, excuse me, if it took way too long to calculate the block, then let's raise the target number. Because when we raise the target number, that makes it more likely that someone is going to find a solution more quickly. So in practice, you might see a flow that looks like this right here. Maybe we start off calculating block 1,100 on the network. And maybe we have a requirement that we have to find a hash that has a value less than 1,000. And let's imagine that with this requirement right here, it took the entire network 20 seconds to find a solution. So in this case, the network would say, whoa, hold up, that was way too long. It took us way too long to find a solution. We want to calculate a block within 15 seconds. So you know what, for the next block that we calculate, let's try to raise the difficulty limit. Let's try to try to find a value rather than less than 1,000, which might take a really long time. Let's just try to find a hash that is less than 10,000. So this kind of expands the window of valid hashes that we can calculate. But we can maybe imagine that when we expand that window up to 10,000, maybe the hash time, maybe the block time goes all the way down to five seconds. And then the network says, well, hold up, that's way too fast. Let's kind of decrease the limit, limit now. And so we kind of split the difference between 1,000 and 10,000. And we now go down to 5,000. So we're trying to find a value or a hash that has a value less than 5,000 now. Maybe this takes 17 seconds. And so the network says, okay, you know, this feels right, this feels good. And then we go on to the next step over here. And well, you know, 17 seconds is good, but it still took maybe slightly too much time. So on the next block, let's try to find a hash less than 4,000. And maybe that then gives us 15 seconds here. Now you might be thinking, why is there so much variance here? You know, is there any variance? Why does it take different amounts of time? And why do we have to kind of adjust this difficulty tar target between blocks? Well, remember the number of people who are, ex who are running uh, nodes on the Ethereum network at any given time is always in flux. People might be starting up nodes to calculate these hashes. Other people might be turning their computers off. So at any given time, the number of computers that are trying to calculate these valid hashes is always going to be changing. And so this difficulty target always has to be adjusted between every block to meet the actual computing availability of the Ethereum network. All right, now there's one last thing that I wanna tell you about, just because it's a very interesting website that's going to kinda of shed a little bit of light on what's happening here. So I'm gonna put the link to it on the screen right here. We're gonna to go to etherscan.io chart slash block time. So this is a fantastic little chart that shows you the average amount of time that has taken to calculate these blocks over the last, I don't know, two years or so. 
So you can see more recently, and chances are when you're watching this video, the graph will extend far into the future. But at least for me right now, some of the most recent block times were around 15 seconds. Now there was some point in time where they took all the way up to 30 seconds, but clearly something happened that reduced that down to about 13 and then back up to 15 or so. So you can always check out this chart right here to get a good idea of what the current block time is. And it'll give you some idea of how long it might take for a transaction to actually be computed and finalized by the network. Okay, so at long last, after a lot of discussion, we now have a good idea of exactly why it took so much time for that transaction to be completed and actually send some money from that faucet account over to yours on the RinkV network. So now that we have a better idea of what's going on with that, let's continue in the next video.